there, listening audience. This is Michael Cross here again with another episode of Unlock the Door Radio, where we have a motto here, and that is to question authority, to ask those kinds of questions that will delve into things deeper, to try finding things you don't normally read about or see in the mainstream media. And tonight, we're not going to be talking politics as we usually do, or um, anything about psychopaths or psychological conditions or anything. Instead, we have a really neat guest here, and her name is Penny Sartori. I hope I pronounced that right, Penny. Yes, you did. <laughs> Excellent. She's joining us from, uh, now I know it's England, is it London? No, it's um, actually it's Swansea, which is in Wales, in the UK. Okay, well, for um, our listening audience in the United States, England's that island that's right off of Europe, and then Wales is a little bit further inland from that. <laughs> Always have to take a jab at uh, at uh, geography knowledge of Americans there. <laughs> so anyway, okay, I've been reading over your article that appeared in the UK Daily Mail, and if people want to uh, read that, they can just type in Penny Sartani, uh, ah, Sartori, I should know that better, I was just in Rome. Um, and it, that's Italian, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And uh, just type in Penny Sartori, near-death experience, um, UK mail online. And it's a really good article. But anyway, i just like to ask, what got you involved in the whole field of uh, near-death experience research? Well, it's because I used to work as a nurse. I was a nurse for 21 years, and I w worked in the ICU, intensive care, for 17 of those years. And it was because of my job. I see death on a very frequent basis. Sometimes I can see three or four deaths in just one shift. And it was one night shift when I was looking after a patient who was clearly dying, and it made me question what happens when we die. He had, you know, we, we made this connection and it really had this profound impact on me. It really affected me. And so it made me question about death. And so I started reading a lot about death. And I looked at courses that would help me to care for dying patients in the ICU. But there was no appropriate course. It was all kind of palliative care, which has a very different approach. And so when I started reading about death, I came across near-death experiences And I thought, wow, these are really fascinating things. These people are saying that death is a wonderful experience. It's very pleasant. There's no pain. And it's a really lovely thing. So I think my scientific training as a nurse made me a bit sceptical. And I just thought, well, it's probably just the brain shutting down, some sort of hallucination or some sort of wishful thinking. But I became more and more intrigued And the more I read about them, I thought, well, I'm working in a perfect place. I could just do my own research and find out. And so that's what I did. And in 1997, I began the UK's first long term um, research study. And uh, that lasted for five years, gathering the data where I interviewed patients who'd survived their illness in the ICU. And then it took a further three years to analyze the data and to write it up. And okay, then, is that what became the basis of your book? It is, yes, yeah. And then I was um, awarded a PhD for the research that I did then. Okay, real quick here, uh, what's the name of your book? Uh, the book is called The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences. Okay, so I think people can find that on Amazon probably and some yes. other distributors. Uh-huh. Okay, so anyway, you're starting a research study that a lot of people... Uh, I know there'd be biases um, against the idea of uh, studying near-death experience from what they would consider maybe a religious perspective or something. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned the thing about the, uh, the dying brain. And I've heard skeptics make comments that the, the you know, when you experience severe trauma, and of course, you know, your brain suddenly not getting oxygen anymore is a severe trauma, mm -hmm. that that would just maybe cause a, a flood of endorphins that would then cause a, a hallucinatory uh, euphoric state, actually, like if you were taking drugs. Um, mm -hmm. Well, what is, what is the 
what was the reaction, first of all, before I get to the whole brain chemistry, but what was the reaction when you approached people to do a PhD study on something that many people would consider more metaphysical versus uh, something that would have to do with medical care? Yeah, well, at first, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, what, you're going to do some research into that? You're crazy. And I got a lot of, you know, skepticism. And, you know, I've had that throughout the whole time I was doing it. But the reason I've been doing this research is to see if we can have a greater understanding of the dying process, because it's something that we know very little about. And so that was the reason I was doing it. It was more so that we could gain something from this research that would enhance our care of dying patients. And that is the main reason that I did that study, because that man that I made the connection with, he had a very prolonged and suffering death. And it's something that I wouldn't want any of my family to go through. And indeed, I wouldn't want to go through it myself. And that's been the driving force of the research, really. Okay. Now, he survived. No, no, he didn't. He died. Okay, but you were you able to interview him or something when he was in this process or no, afterwards I, no what what happened is that he had this prolonged death and he knew he was dying and he was quite kind of begging me to let him die but of course he was in the ICU and we were treating him and doing everything that we could to kind of make to keep him alive and um, it was just something I, it made me think, you know, is, is death that bad that we've got to put patients through all this, even when they know they're dying and they want to die? And so that was the driving force for me, really. Mm -hmm. And so then afterwards, then you started your research on the process of death itself. Yeah, well, I became intrigued, you see, by the near-death experiences that I'd read about. And I thought, well, if these people who have been clinically dead, who've had a cardiac arrest, have had this experience and they say it's a wonderful experience. Does that happen for everyone? And so that's what I wanted to do. And so people have these experiences in other contexts apart from a, um, the cardiac arrest as well. So I wanted to explore near-death experiences from all possible angles. And I think working in the ICU gave me that direct access to the patients then as well who were potentially going to have this experience. Okay, so tell me your research method while you were in the ICU and how you were able to gather your data on uh, NDEs. Well, basically, all of the patients who survived their illness or their admission to the intensive care unit, I would just go up to them at the bedside and introduce myself, have a little chat with them, and then I would just simply ask the question, do you have any memories of the time that you were unconscious? Now, most people didn't remember anything at all, and they looked at me a bit blankly. Some people were a bit cautious, and they were saying, mm, well, mm, I can remember a few things. And then they would kind of, I'd say, I'd say to them, well, I'm very interested in everyone's experiences, and some people have unusual experiences. Can you describe what you recall? And then, indeed, some people would describe things which were in keeping with a near-death experience. So I had a standard interview protocol that if it appeared that they did have an experience, they would then complete that after I invited them to um, participate in the research and I gained their consent then. Okay, um, before we continue here, now some skeptics will say that if near-death experiences are a metaphysical uh, experience that everyone would experience it in some way. But now I've, if I write in that most people, when they are in the state, like you're in the ICU, um, most people are really heavily sedated in, in, um, these situations and would have a really hard time remembering anything when they would come out of it. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's what I found, in fact. A lot of people would say that these experiences are due to the drugs that we give to the patients. But when I analysed the data, what I found was that those who'd had lots of these um, sedative and painkilling drugs, they were less likely to re report a near-death experience. So rather than contributing to them, they actually had an inhibitory effect on having such an experience. But, of course, some people had these experiences in the absence of having drugs as well. But it, but even those who did have the drugs and did have the experience, 
it's as if the the experience in some way overrode the other things that were going on and this experience was like a heightened state of awareness something that you wouldn't expect a patient who has lots of sedative drugs in their system they you they wouldn't have that level of cognitive function so that's what really fascinated me as well yeah because i i've read about i've never used it myself um and but i've read about when people take drugs such as lsd which cause a flood of course of of all of these um um endorphins as well as uh shutting off some sections of the brain while heightening the awareness in others but it, in every case I've ever read about, what you get is like a psychedelic dream. You get a, a lot of flashy images. You don't get a coherent, like no one comes and visits you or anything. If they do, they're like floating in the air and then suddenly they turn into a bunny rabbit or something and these kinds of things. But you didn't see that with these NDEs you studied. No, with the NDEs, they, they did follow a set pattern and they were very clear and lucid and precise. But there are similarities between the near-death experience and drug experiences, but the contexts are slightly different as well. You know, when patient people take LSD, for example, they do so with the intention of getting some sort of trip. With the near-death experience, it's not planned. It's something that's totally out of the blue. It can happen in a second when it's really not expected. So the contexts are very different, although it could be that they are accessing this same altered state of consciousness during both experiences, but it's interpreted in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So you you go through and you start collecting. I want to get into you know your findings and more specifics in just a moment, but I, I just want to deal with some of the research method. So you, you gathered all of these people, you looked at their reports, and you found similarities then, things that seemed to uh, run through all of them. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I, they completed a Grayson near-death experience scale. This was devised by Professor Bruce Grayson, who's a psychiatrist in um, America. And um, this scale is a 16-point choice multiple uh, multiple choice questionnaire. And basically it's used to distinguish if a near-death experience has occurred or just some other sort of hallucination. So if there's a multiple score of a uh, maximum score of 32, minimum score of zero, and a score of seven or above indicates that a near-death experience has occurred. And so once they completed the Grayson scale, I then continued to a very in-depth interview. And, um, and then basically I kind of analysed all of the different interviews that I did just to see if they did follow a set pattern. And indeed they did. In 1975, Dr. Raymond Moody um, wrote the book Life After Life and he had a set of components which were very kind of um, characteristic of near-death experiences. And I found that the people in my study reported many of these components as well. Okay. Okay. So, if we if we rule out such things as drug induced, uh, you know, kinds of hallucinations, and also um, some sort of synaptic explosion, you know, that would that would give you like an LSD effect, then essentially, are you feeling that these people are having a well? I've heard the out of body experience. Um, so you're saying there's some sort of uh, separation that's taking place? Well, most people, when they were having this experience, some of them did have this out of body experience. It started off like that. And they felt that their true self wasn't down there on the bed where they could see themselves. They felt that they were existing up above and looking down. And so they kind of didn't associate their consciousness as being part of the body, but their consciousness was a very separate entity, and it was a heightened state of awareness than usual waking consciousness. Mm -hmm. And these people were that did maybe they came in. On, I've heard cases where um, most of these people come in; they're being worked on, like you know, people think of these scenes from uh, TV. 
uh, doctor dramas, you know, the patients coming in, they're totally unconscious, everyone's frantically working and, and getting them, go, you know, trying to bring them back to life. Mm-hmm. And I've heard a lot of people when they come out of a near death experience can actually describe the people that were in the room and what was going on, even though they were totally unconscious. Yeah, absolutely. And there was one case in my study which was very clear like that. It was a patient I happened to be looking after on that day. And while he was deeply unconscious, he described himself being up near the ceiling. In fact, he described himself being higher than the ceiling, looking down. And he very accurately described the actions of the doctor. And he identified which doctor it was that was examining him. He also accurately reported the nurse's actions, which were my actions, and he also accurately reported what the physiotherapist was doing. Now, what he reported was extremely accurate. It was precise. And this happened at the time when he was deeply unconscious. He wasn't responding to deep, painful stimuli. And I know that what he reported was accurate because I was there. I was the nurse looking after him at the time. And uh, further to this experience as well, he also had other components of the near-death experience where he went into a pink room, met his dead father and also a Jesus-like figure and also his dead mother-in-law. And he'd never met his mother-in-law before, but he recognised her from photographs. And he was really happy and comfortable where he was and he wanted to stay there. But this Jesus-type figure said, no, it's not your time, you have to go back. And as soon as he said that, he felt himself drifting backwards. The image faded before his eyes. And as soon as he was back in his body, he was in immediate pain. And it was so bad that he wished he was dead. But there's also a really interesting aspect of this case, because when I followed this man up, I realised that um, he misinterpreted one of my questions. And this man has cerebral palsy and his right hand is in a permanently contracted position. But after his near-death experience, he can now open out his hand. And there's no physiological explanation for this. I'd asked the doctors and I asked the physiotherapists about this. And they said it shouldn't be possible without an operation to release the tendons because his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. But nothing like this was done. There was no surgery. There was no hand physiotherapy. And he then developed the full use of his hand. So that is something that can't really be explained so you know when you do these researches in the hospital you uncover really unusual cases like this as well Mm -hmm. yeah and i just point out to the listeners that what you're saying is this was more of a joint and ligament type of damage in his hand Mm -hmm. and so if you were to say that well maybe his brain uh structure was changed by the event neurologically that will should not have hap- that should not have actually caused his hand to work better yeah that's right you, you know no one can work out how this has happened and uh, you know i spoke with the, the patient's sister as well and she assured me that for the whole of his life he's never been op- able to open his hand out and she signed a statement to say that it's only since the near death experience that he's able to open his hand out fully oh really interesting you know it it sounds to me that now, I know there's got to be some skeptics out there. They're listening, and that's that's okay. But the George Will, who is, well, he's a journalist, and he was writing about, you know, how people view their existence and stuff like that. He was saying that um, to someone that believes in nothing beyond the physical and the material, that you are your body. You are the sum components. Your brain your hands, your stomach, they're all just part of a biological mechanism. So essentially emotions uh, and and memories are all part of synapses and so forth. Whereas other people believe that there is something beyond that. And of course they believe they have a body. Now I would assume you're part of the the latter. You, You believe that we have a body. Well, I don't know, you see, because I think the more research that I do and the more studying that I do, my views change. They're not static. And I think I have to keep an open mind. And I think there may be more research comes along that would kind of make me think differently. I don't know. So I think I I really try to keep as open a mind as possible. 
you know, I've done all this research, but I still don't have the answers. It's thrown up more questions and it's, um, you know, then it's answered for me. So I, I, I'm still learning, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I was just thinking that if the human body was working like a computer, you know, like uh, uh, if I have a program that I want to send from one computer to another, I can do that even though the, the first computer might, I don't know, break. Uh -huh. uh, right as I'm sending it, but I still have my program that's been sent. And I've heard that analogy used by some people that maybe we are, you know, our bodies are like a transmitter. They're a machine. And that would explain why, even though you might not actually be dead laying there on the table, you, you still get these people that will say that they can see what was going on. They can perceive it. Correct. Yes, that's right. And, um, this is one of the questions that's raised for me, really, is what is consciousness? Because we don't really understand what consciousness is. Up until recently, our science, well, it still believes that consciousness is produced by the brain. But the more research that's being done into near-death experiences would suggest otherwise now. So rather than the brain producing the consciousness, maybe it just mediates the consciousness. And one thing that kind of makes most sense to me in light of the work that I've done is that um, the brain in some way acts like a filter. And this consciousness or this heightened state of awareness is around us constantly, but we're just not aware of it because the brain screens it out. It would be too overwhelming. But there are times in our life when that filter action becomes dysfunctional. And rather than the brain producing this state, all it's doing is allowing this heightened state state of awareness into our everyday waking consciousness and that makes more sense to me because during a near-death experience the brain is severely dysfunctional so you would expect that filter action to break down perhaps when someone's taken something like lsd that would have an impact on the filter action of the brain as well so i think there are varying contexts in which in which this heightened state of awareness can be accessed but i think it's probably most profound during a near-death experience because the brain is actually se severely physiologically insulted. Okay. Um, so let's play skeptic again. Uh, I, and then I want to ask about uh, Melvin Morse because I've read some of his books. Maybe you could tell uh, uh, listeners uh, who exactly he is. Yeah, Melvin Morse is a pediatrician and he did some great work on near-death experiences in children back in the 1980s. And he did some really great work there and he's written quite a few books as well and published lots of articles. So his work is very well um, respected. Okay, and he didn't start out trying to prove some sort of metaphysical thing, did he? No, not at all. Like most people, really, who start off in the field, they, they kind of do it out of a curiosity. And he was trying to disprove it and say that, yep, yeah, this is all due to the brain and uh, find physiological causes for the experience. Mm -hmm. And I believe he did something unique, though. He His subjects were all small children. That's correct, yes. Now, do you happen to re remember why he chose small children as his test subjects? just because he's a paediatrician and there was a young girl that he had actually been part of um, helping her when she was uh, severely critically ill. And um, when he went to follow her up as she was recovering, she reported um, aspects of a near-death experience. And that really interested him and his work went on from there. Okay. Yeah. And the one intriguing thing too, I think, with children is the idea that they're not maybe going to be as vulnerable to, well, you know, maybe uh, building up a fantasy of what people, you know, what death would be like. You know, I mean, if, if you were going to say that maybe you just hear about it in the popular press or you go to church or something and you hear what it's all about. But if you're four years old, you're not going to be able to uh, put together all these abstract notions you would hear in the media or at church. No, exactly. And that's what's really intriguing about these experiences, because when you hear them from children, it really kind of makes you think again. You know, the, in my book, um, I feature a case of a young boy and his father actually wrote to me and he said, 
when I was working on the army base in Berlin in Germany a few years ago, um, his son had become very unwell, needed emergency surgery, and he was in the operating room. And he said his son had a cardiac arrest on the table, but he did make a recovery. And um, it was a few weeks after his recovery, and the father actually had a day off. There was a relief on the base, so he had a day off. And he said to his son, where should we go for the day? Should we go out? Where do you want to go? And he said, oh, I, I want to go to the park. And his father thought, well, he's not been to a park. There's no parks around here. So he said, which park would you like to go to? And he said, oh, the park that I went to in the hospital, the one through the tunnel. He said it was a lovely park. I went through the tunnel and in this park there were people playing and there was a white fence around it. And I went to climb over the fence, but the man behind it said, no, I had to go back. And he sent me back through the tunnel and I went back into the hospital. And as his father said, you know, he was four years old when he was telling me this. And I just find it really hard to think that he could have he could make something like this up. He just said it very matter of factly. So I think that's very intriguing when cases of young children like that are reported. Have, have you had many cases where people have actually described meeting someone? Now, you said the thing about the picture, I, I you know, the mother-in-law and that sort of thing. Of course, he would know that person existed. Mm -hmm. But have you had situations where maybe a child is born and dies and then later another child is, you know, comes along and then they have a near death experience and they've never heard about this child that was their sibling and then meeting them and 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 uh, then asking the parents about it? Yes. Now, I've, I didn't come across that in the hospital research, but I've had people write into me over the years and they've described cases like this where the, the child has actually identified another child, even a child that had died when it was um, still in the womb and hadn't been born, and children had described meeting and this, uh, this other child as well. And in fact... Yes? Other who he'd never seen before, but he, he had seen him during the near-death experience. So that, again, is another case which fascinates me, really. Okay. And, uh, I want to jump into this here, too. Um, now, I I was listening to some radio preacher one time when I was in the car, <laughs> and uh, he was saying that near-death experience, he didn't believe in them because... Uh, he said that non-believers and people that were like, I don't know, Catholics and Mormons and Muslims and stuff, they all had them too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said, no, that just can't be. But have you found that it doesn't matter what their religious faith is, that people will still have these very vivid uh, experiences? Oh, yes, absolutely. People from all different cultures have these experiences, and they are very much influenced by the cultural background. So, for example, in the West, people are more likely to see images of Jesus Christ or Mary, um, whereas in a different culture, perhaps different things are perceived. So, for example, Hindus may perceive a Hindu deity. Um, people in India, for example, may see a man called Chitragupta, who is the man with the book. And this book contains the deeds of all of their life. So it shows all the good things that they've done and all the bad things that they've done. And then it decides on the fate of the person after that stage. And so these experiences are very much culturally influenced, but they are described by people of all different faiths and religions. Mm -hmm. But then again, I mean, if you um, if you saw a man, a man or woman or whatever in a in a military uniform, Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you saw it in America, you would just assume that's an American soldier. If you saw someone in the same uniform in Russia, you'd think that was a Russian soldier, but they'd uh -huh. still be wearing a uniform. And therefore, that's what you mean, right? I mean, it's like. Yeah, it's it's a sort of perception of the same sort of thing. Yes. OK, so so do you find that a lot of people may actually have been unbelievers in anything and then they have a near death experience and they suddenly uh, become religious or at least metaphysical? Yeah, there are cases like that. There's a very uh, famous case, the case of Howard Storm, and he was an atheist and didn't have any belief in God or any faith, 
And he had this near-death experience and it totally changed his view, totally changed his life. And he then trained as a minister and um, he's written a very interesting book as well. So um, there's many cases like that. You know, there's, um, oh, there's a Professor George Rodenoyer as well. And he he trained to become a, a Russian Orthodox priest as a result of his near-death experience as well. So it does influence people greatly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I can imagine. I mean, all of a sudden, you, you you have to explain this this occurrence, and there's no real way of explaining it. Now, the um, oh, I was just kind of kind of lost my um, train of thought there. Do you have situations in which people uh, will, when they are still kind of in a like a, I mean, they're kind of semi-conscious, but they are claiming that they see people in the room and that they're having conversations with them, and then when they do regain consciousness, they can vividly recall that? Yes, I've seen that several times. Um, This is more prevalent as people are making that transition into death, as they are dying. They're called end-of-life experiences or deathbed visions, and I witnessed that quite a lot during my nurse training. And in fact, I can remember the first day on the ward, as a student nurse, I was sitting in the office. The night nurse was handing over to that, to the morning shift. And she said, oh, the man in bed six will be dead by the end of the morning. He's been talking to his dead mother since 3 a.m. And I looked around and I thought, are they saying that now to wind me up because it's my first day? And I looked around and everyone carried on as if it was quite normal. So after the report finished, I went out and I started to observe this patient And indeed, he was talking to someone and gesturing to someone who I couldn't see. And I went back and forth during the course of the morning. And about 11.30 a.m., he suddenly got some energy from somewhere. And it's as if he tried to sit up and he outstretched his arms as if reaching out to someone. And then he had this big smile on his face. And then he just kind of lay back down, looked as if he was going off to sleep, but he actually died. So it seems that he was communicating with someone who I couldn't see. So that stuck with me, really, throughout the course of my nurse training. And it was something that I paid attention to in other patients as well. And it is quite commonly observed and accepted by other nurses because they've seen these things as well. And very often these visions start about two to three days before the patient actually does die. But very often they have a very comforting effect for the patients and it's something that they welcome. Okay, so it sounds like then that people that have gone through near-death experiences wouldn't be as scared of death in the future. Absolutely, and I was talking about this actually to um, a hospice consultant, and she for many years had looked after patients who were dying, and she said the ones who had the most peaceful transitions into death were people who'd had a near-death experience previously. It's as if it gives them a a kind of different understanding of everything. And indeed, people who've had the near-death experience have said to me, it's not that I want to die now, but when it's my time, I know what to expect. I've been there, and it's a lovely experience. I'm not afraid to die. And that's very common amongst people who've had this near-death experience. Does it matter what kind of person they were? I, you know, religiously, I mean, there shouldn't be any difference, ultimately, if everyone's built the same way and has a soul or whatever. Um, but in a context of when you have people that have led very bad lives, uh, have you heard reports whether they have a different sort of experience? Do, are they... Do they have an experience of feeling overwhelming guilt or uh, do they find themselves going somewhere that maybe they don't want to go? Well, yes, it um, it does have a very different kind. It can have different um, effects on different people. Now, people who have been really bad in their life can just have the, the usual kind of near-death experience, but it gives them a different insight. And when they come back to life, It's as if they think, oh, my gosh, that was a wake up call. What have I been doing with my life? Also, as well, some people get like a life review where they experience the impact of their actions on other people. And so if they've been particularly 
be unpleasant or violent to someone. They can feel what it's like to be on the receiving end of that unpleasantness or that violence. And um, consequently, uh, conversely as well, if they've been particularly good to someone, they feel what it's like to receive that love as well. So during this life review, sometimes they watch their life review in, in the presence of something or being of light. And very often this being of light is actually acting like some sort of comfort because the person themselves is judging themselves. And so that has a profound effect on them and how they live their life when they go back to life. So I think the life review is something that really ju does bring home to them the way that they've been living their life and how their actions impact on other people. Mm, I've heard that like people have tried to commit suicide. They they get like an overwhelming guilt of what that would have done to the people around them, and they're never suicidal after that if they survive. Yes, that's right. It do, it does seem to have that um, kind of puts them off doing it again in the future. You know, they have a different insight into everything, a different insight into their problems, and they realize that suicide is simply not an option because they they would take their problems with them wherever they go. So it's it's something that does have a very, make them consider their life very differently. And then when they come back to life, they're also very appreciative of what they do have in their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard too that, uh, maybe you've seen this, that, that people report in near-death experiences that if, if they come from a, re, if they've had a really good marriage, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the spouse, you know, their spouse has died before they did. And they have a really good marriage. They often will meet up with the person they were married to, husband or wife. But if they had a really horrible one, you know, there was abuse and stuff, that they don't usually meet up with the uh, the deceased spouse. Is that correct or just things I've heard? Um. Well, I, I don't think there's enough evidence to kind of sh suggest that. There may be cases which would support both of what you've said, but I have not particularly come across that. I know people who um, do have the experience meet up with dead relatives, but I'm not sure about abusive spouses. I've not really got many cases. Uh, well, I don't think I've got a case of that, to be honest with you, so I've not really thought about that aspect. Mm hmm Okay. I was just trying to... See that yeah, you know, it seems that it seems then when people pass on that their their family relationships pass with them. Yeah, I guess they could well do. Yeah, I'm not. Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Haven't have, thought. About that. Okay, have you seen people that you know nurses or doctors that when they first start they might have been very skeptical of hearing these stories told to them by people that you've studied. And then as time goes on, they're they're convinced. Oh, yeah, I've seen that quite a lot. And um, in fact, you know, when I first started doing my nurse training, I can remember the first time I'd heard of a near death experience. I was um, a, a student nurse and I'd looked after a lady for 10 days in a row. And it was only on the 10th day that she kind of got to trust me, I guess. And she said to me, do you know, when I... Um, was in the coronary care unit I went to heaven and I said oh right okay so she started to describe where she'd had this out-of-body experience and then gone through a tunnel and it was in this beautiful place and met her dead mother and at the time I listened to what she was saying but I just thought it was some sort of hallucination and I can remember thinking to myself oh they gave her too much diamorphine in the coronary care unit and I didn't question her about it because I had this preconceived idea that it was just a hallucination. So I didn't even think twice about it. And it was only afterwards, you know, when I a few years later, when I seriously got into researching these experiences, that I realized that I'd missed an opportunity to find out more about, about these experiences. And since doing my research, I'm, I'm definitely convinced that these experiences occur. What they mean, I don't quite know yet. But, you know... They, they certainly do occur, and they're very real to the people who have them, and they have very real life-transforming effects as well. Mm -hmm. hey, I was wondering, if you, have you ever, because there, there are many people that believe that life is a continuum. It just doesn't start in the womb and then go on and then go somewhere else afterwards. But 
have you ever had situations where someone uh, that's younger that has had something happen, like a severe trauma or something, an accident, and then they are told they meet someone who's not yet been born, who's telling them that they're going to be their mother or father, and then later it happens? Yeah, there, there are quite a lot of cases like that um, in the literature. They, they're very much anecdotal cases, so it's very difficult to scientifically study these sort of cases. But if you look in the literature, there's lots of books out there now and um, which suggest that there is some sort of pre-birth consciousness as well. So it's an interesting thing, you know, consciousness. We just don't know enough about it at the moment. And um, I think we need to do a lot more research before... We could, we'll fully understand it. Okay. Um, so, what is your going? What is your work going to be in the future? I mean, uh, obviously, you're not going to just, you know, okay, wrote the book, it's out there, do some new stuff, and then go on. What would you like to continue doing in the future? Right. Well, it's interesting you ask that because since my book has come out, I've been receiving about 200 emails a day from people who've had these experiences. And I've had some fascinating cases. I haven't replied to them all because I, I just can't get round to it, but I am kind of getting through it. But what I want to do is do some more research with people who have contacted me, because one thing that really fascinates me about these experiences is that some people, after their near-death experience, seem to get changes in their electromagnetic field. And what they find is that wristwatches won't work for them, clocks any sort of watch will stop it'll work for other people but it won't work for them things like light bulbs will blow um, computers will malfunction f photocopying machines will malfunction and I, that is something that really fascinates me because that's something that we can really investigate at a scientific level to find out in which way their electromagnetic field has changed and why so I want to do more research of that and there are other aspects as, as well that I want to research. So this is something that, I, that is ongoing for me. I've still got so many questions that are unanswered. So I still want to continue researching these experiences. Hey, you know, I got two things there. One is that uh, when you talk about the electrical field thing, and people probably are kind of like, well, that sounds really hippie-ish or new age or something. But mm -hmm. I would note that, I was listening to someone give a presentation who used to be one of the heads of DARPA. You know, that's where they do the uh, all those weird experiments on how better to blow things up over in the United States. All right. And um, she was she she showed on this talk show this little tiny grain of sand type thing, but it was a special microchip. And you'd, you know, it, they have a prototype. It's just, you know, it's not out in manufacture yet, but you'd swallow it and it would give you, uh, it would turn your body into like an antenna. And it would work on your stomach acids and that would power it. And, uh, you know, she was talking about how the human body could be turned into like this electromagnetic field, which obviously implies that we do have an electronic field anyway. This would just heighten it in something that would be interpreted like if you wanted to use your body as a scan, you know, thing when you, instead of carrying a credit card or cash through the store. Right. So I just thought that was kind of fa funny how you said that because at first it sounds like, well, that's really weird. But then you realize science is working on the human antenna type yeah. of thing. So yeah. it's, it's, it's out there. If you want to just, just type in, you know, that and or I'll send you the link to it just so you can. Yeah. Take it. it just seems odd. The the uh, the other thing that I would ask is uh, I, I love history. Mm -hmm. Been to Russia quite a few times. I've been to the place where uh, uh, the conspirators killed uh, Rasputin. All right. And, and you know at the um, uh, Yusupov Palace in Saint Petersburg, and. Mm -hmm. I've been told by experts on Rasputin when I've been there that when he was like 14, he drowned. I mean, yeah. they all thought he was dead. I mean, they drug him up. You know, it was like, OK, you know, sorry, he, he's gone. But he came back. And afterwards, he said that was when he became psychic. He could start seeing things. He became yeah. clairvoyant. Um, but before that, he said he didn't have those things. He had an interest in religion, but he was not 
he didn't have any spark. Do you see people suddenly saying that they're that they start getting hit with? Um, premonitions, uh, more of the deja vu, uh, actual. Yes, you know, yeah, yeah, go definitely. ahead. There's a lot of people after their near death experience find that it changes everything for them. And yes, they do. They get more, far more premonitions and they can tell what people are thinking. They can read people's minds. They can tell if something bad is going to happen. There was one lady who had premonitions that were so strong that it actually made her into a bit of a recluse. She was afraid to go out in public because every time she walked towards someone, she could tell something if something bad was going to happen to them. So now the only way that she leaves will go out of her house is if she's got her iPod speakers on and if she's got dark glasses and she'll go out and put her head down so she doesn't have to make eye contact with people because she can just tell when bad things are going to happen to people. And a lot of people as well become quite psychic and sometimes they get like a healing ability as well. Now, that is really interesting because that is something that could benefit our healthcare system greatly. You know, there's um, quite a lot of people who feel like their hands kind of heat up or intuitively they will know when someone is unwell and they will go and they can put their hands on the, the affected part of the body and that will help a person as well and in fact I've recently been speaking to one man um, on the internet who has had this healing ability where he can diagnose it or perceive if a cancer is present before any scans have actually been done to verify it so I think you know that there's huge potential benefits if we understood these experiences and used them in future healthcare as well so you know it's something that we really need to take a lot of notice of and i think these these experiences are so important mm -hmm. yeah i'm just reminded of I, I did an interview recently with someone who was talking about transhumanism and the idea that in the very near future we'll be wired to where we'll be able to read other people's thoughts you know mechanically we'll sure. we'll, we'll have that ability so again when people are thinking, oh, there's some psychic type thing or something, um, there is a basis for being able to interpret thoughts. It's just that whether, you know, someday we'll all do it with with um, some sort of electrical implant or headpiece, it still seems to be something that's not out of the realm of possibility. So therefore, we can't dis discount the idea that it could actually it could actually exist. Um, in areas we don't understand. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, we're, we're advancing more and more. Our technology is getting that much greater. And I think, you know, we're, we're just making new discoveries all the time. And I think it's a very exciting time to be alive because we're actually doing this kind of research now and realizing that we can use it and harness it to benefit mankind. Mm -hmm. Now, in the closing few minutes, I'd like, I usually do this. If, if someone... If someone wants a preview of your book, if they start like the very beginning, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, uh, what are they in for? You know, tell tell us, uh, you know, why someone should be like, hey, you know, I, I got to get my hands on that book and read it in more detail. Yeah, well, it starts off in, with the experience I had on that night shift with the patient who was dying, and it kind of describes why I got into the research. And then it's basically it's the introduction is what a near death experience is. And then it gives you all the sort of information on the experiences, because what I realized is that my my colleagues in the hospital when I was working there, you know, a lot of them didn't understand what near death experiences were. They had these preconceived ideas. So what I've done is just kind of put out what the near death experience is. I've defined it and I've used lots of different examples of people I've come across over the years. And I've also looked at things like the after effects of the near death experience, the childhood near death experiences. Um, I look at the cultural variations and I also look at things like the end of life experience, um, after death communications, empathic death experiences. Now, these are interesting. The empathic experience is where someone at the bedside of the dying person also shares in like a partial journey into the light with the person. It's as if they're in the, a vision with the dying person. So they oh, like, wait, 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 you're saying that sometimes um, if I was at the bedside of someone who was dying, I might actually witness things 
that they are going through uh, beyond just them laying there, uh, you know, taking their last breaths. Yes, yes. I've got a few examples of those in the book. Um, and they're fascinating, you know, because the person at the, the bedside of the dying person, there's nothing wrong with them. Their brains aren't dying. So how is it that they can have this experience as well, you know? And again, they have a very transformative and profound effect on the person as well. And it also helps them with the grieving process. One man said to me, you know, that should have been the saddest day of my life. My wife had just died. But he said I was leaving her hospital room with a big smile on my face because of what I'd experienced with her. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're just fascinating experiences, you know, and it's something that we don't know enough about. Yeah, and I was just 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 uh, remembered too that that people that have taken other uh, drugs such as mescaline uh -huh. will will report uh, more vivid experiences than like LSD that are more cohesive. But at the same time, the shamans who have used this stuff for thousands of years mm -hmm. say actually they will say this actually shuts things down to where you start seeing things that normally people wouldn't see and yeah. therefore it's not just okay well if you take this drug this proves it doesn't work yeah i mean it, it proves it can be mimicked therefore there must be something just biochemical to it but maybe certain traumas induced by drugs could actually cause the brain to then function just like it is when it's being connected to these other areas of life yeah, it could be just that these um, drugs are just breaking down that filter action of the brain and allowing this altered state to be experienced. Mm -hmm. And it could be, you know, and then the trauma of it during a near-death experience is having the same sort of effect. So it's, I think they're similar experiences, but they're also ac accessing the same altered state of awareness and consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So it's not something that actually get in a way. It actually doesn't give more ammunition to the skeptics. It actually sounds like your research takes away some of their ammunition. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. It, that's right. It would. You know. And, we, and we've got to be open-minded to this. You know. I, I think skeptical people have very valid arguments as well. And I've looked at those arguments. But you know, when when you do this work in the clinical area, it just doesn't. It doesn't all add up. You know, there's something more to these experiences that we're just not understanding, and we have to pay attention to them. There's one thing you may never have experienced this, but i got to ask it. I just remembered it. Um, now, I've heard stuff to this effect, but I want to know if you've heard it too, that people who've maybe been born with some sort of handicap, like a certain sensory mode doesn't exist, like they're born blind. I mean, they're, they're, they've never had eyesight. And mm -hmm. then they go through a near-death experience. Um... Do they report that they actually experience those things when they come back? Yes, there are cases of people who've had a blind, uh, people who are blind, who have had a near death experience and actually describe kind of looking down and seeing their body as well and actually describe things that they were wearing, like rings and jewelry and things like that. So that's okay. quite interesting. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that must really be a shocker for them to actually. <laughs> have that experience they might not want to come back if they suddenly you know have the experience of sight there aha uh -huh, yeah that's right it's uh yeah it's just a such an unusual thing okay okay la last minute here can you tell uh all of our listeners if they're sitting at the computer right now where they can look up all of your information yeah i've got a website and it's drpennysartori.com and i've also got a blog and that's drpennysartori.wordpress.com. And they can go, and also you're on Amazon. What's the name of your book again? Yeah. The name of my book is The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, and that's available on Amazon. Okay, great. All right. Well, I just thank you for um, informing us here of what I consider a very, very special thing because, you know, everyone has friends, family that are, you know, that are going to die. They, Everyone's experienced death. They're going to experience death. Unless Ray Kurzweil's right, you're going to go through death someday, <laughs> unless you're uploaded onto his computer. So, um, you know, it, I think it's really something that can help people to to understand this so as to get rid of the fear that surrounds it. Um, 
and able to actually enjoy life by not worrying about death. Yeah, exactly. That's the biggest effect my research has had on me. It's made me appreciate my life and enjoy my life. Okay, that's that. Well, that's an ultimate message that should just go out there. That's enough reason to read your book. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for coming I'll on. Thank you. thank you for asking me. It's been great. Yeah, wonderful. And um, I'd just like to thank my listening audience for tuning in to Unlock the Door Radio and Hope that you'll be tuning in next week for another really interesting program. Take care now. So, so where, where, where has this pursuit taken you? Oh my God! Where have you landed? Why would you ask that? I'm asking you that here and now. It's New York City. It's okay. March 7th. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. <laughs> these are pictures of equations. I've been for the last 15 years trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising, and what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Wait, you're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yeah, our computers? That is correct. So, wait, wait, I'm still, wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> so you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos yes computer code computer code strings of bits of ones and zeros it's not just sort of resembles computer code you're saying it is computer code it's not even just is computer code it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s that's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we say are supersymmetric. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Time to go home, I think. I mean, I, where are we going to go? Ahead? So, so are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? Well, I didn't say that. What were some of those like the Matrix? You, that's of, what you said. Some of those codes are, are showing on the screen behind you right now. They don't look like codes, but these pictures, which we call adinkras, are graphical representations of sets of equations that are based on codes. So this is, in fact, to answer your question more directly, I have in my life come to a very strange place because I never expected that the movie The Matrix might be an accurate representation of the place in which I live. And so my statement is that in the description of our universe, that it's a supersymmetrical universe, which we were going to test in the LHC, if you believe that description, I can show you the presence of these codes. And mechanistic science has a very difficult time explaining how meaning is processed by the brain. So if somebody says to you, I love you, and you're in love with them, then your body makes all these wonderful molecules, serotonin, um, dopamine, oxytocin, they're immunomodulators, they modulate the activity of the immune system. <coughs> and all you heard was three words, I love you. For more news, visit youtube.com forward slash pigmind5. This is Ozzy Skateboard.
and you're listening to